Hey guys, Michael Corsentino with the companion video for my December 2016 lighting column in Shutter Magazine. Uh, first of all, happy holidays everyone. I can't believe it's the end of the year and we're going to finish it out with an awesome tutorial all about shooting in tight spaces and lighting in tight spaces. I think this is something that every photographer can relate to, whether you have a studio of your own or you rent studios to shoot in or you shoot on location. I think that uh, we're all confronted with tight spaces and the challenges that they present to us about how to create and craft the kind of light that we want when we are working with our lights and our subjects right up against the background uh, with very little space to move them off the background. Now, of course, if you have the space, ideally uh, you're going to have a lot more flexibility to move your uh, lights and your subjects uh, off of the background and this way you can light them independently. But this month we're talking about situations when you don't have that flexibility. Uh, what do you do then? How do you create beautiful, compelling light uh, rather than flat and boring light? Uh, how do you uh, separate your model and your background um, to create interesting lighting uh, and the light that you want on both of them? Uh, rather than having everything just kind of lit all at the same time uh, with the same intensity, uh, which ends up creating kind of a boring look, as I will demonstrate for you. So let's take a look at some of my favorite tools uh, that I use for shooting in tight spaces. Uh, so those are going to be smaller light modifiers. So we'll start off here with the Mola Beauty Dish. This is the Mola Demi. It's a 22 inch beauty dish. Uh, I would always be using that in conjunction uh, with a grid uh, when I'm working in a very tight confined space. And what a grid is going to do, this is a grid spot, What are and they come in various uh, degrees. It's a honeycomb grid. Um, uh, I end up using a 20 degree most often, uh, but they come in uh, degrees I think from 10 to 40 uh, is kind of the usual suspect uh, degree range. Um, so I would use that and what the grid is going to do is confine the light to a real small pool or channel of light uh, and keep it where you want it rather than spilling all over the place. Uh, and that's what you get when you don't use a grid. You've got kind of light everywhere. Uh, even with smaller modifiers, uh, but when you use a grid, it's really going to help you to control exactly uh, where you're placing that light and where you're not placing that light, which is even more important. Um, when you're crafting light, you really want to be able to control exactly where you're putting it and where you're not putting it. So that's uh, one of my go-tos. Uh, second is the, uh, it's just a standard reflector. This, in this case, I have pictured here a Profoto reflector uh, along with their set of grids, uh, grid spots, and those just fit inside here and allow you to, again, control exactly where that light is going. Uh, the tighter the uh, grid pattern uh, and in, de in descending order, a 10 degree grid spot is going to give you a much tighter pattern of light than a 40 degree grid spot, for example. And also, uh, smaller soft boxes. Here we've got a 14 by 35 Ellen Chrome uh, strip box, which we used for this shoot, which I'll show you, uh, along with a Light Tools uh, uh, egg crate grid that's right here on the front. Um, these are soft grids, and they uh, the, they're Easy Pop grids, uh, the Light Tools uh, grids that I use, and that are pretty much the grids that you have to choose from when you, when you shoot with Ellen Chrome uh, soft boxes. Those are the grids that are available for these. They are uh, a bit more expensive, but uh, in my opinion, they're worth it. Uh, they're really well built. They last forever. And they've got this really cool internal frame. Uh, their build quality is exceptional. And they've got this internal frame um, uh, called an Easy Pop frame, which uh, allows them to pop into place and maintain their shape more importantly so that the individual cells here and here don't sag and end up compromising the output of the light and the quality of the light that you're getting from the softbox. So that's what you know makes them really worth the investment. Um, so 14 by 35 Ellen Chrome softbox uh, or strip box uh, as it's more commonly known. Um, and here is the Ellen Chrome uh, Deep Octa. This is the larger of the two. Um, there's a smaller size which I use when I travel. Um, 
but uh, this one is what I use when I'm shooting in tighter spaces in the studio um, or on location in a you know confined space. Uh, this also is fitted with a light tools grid, uh, which you can see here. Okay, and again, that's just going to really help me to kind of keep the light where I want it. All right, so those are some of the tools. So first, I want to start off by showing you uh, what I what I want to avoid. Um, when I'm creating this kind of light. Uh, this shows you what I, what I have here. I, I, I did created this so that you could see exactly what not to do. So, and this is really not feasible when you're working in a tight space. Um, I'm in the studio, but we're trying to replicate what, what it's like to shoot in a, basically a 10 by 10 space. So we kind of kept ourselves to that footprint. Um, but you can see here, and this is a 10 foot ceiling height in the studio. Um, you've got this really large uh, octobank placed right behind and above, basically above the camera. Um, and that gives us this really pretty kind of beauty light. Um, but what happens is it's a very flat, kind of boring light without a lot of shadow and not much dimension. And more importantly, because we're so close to the background, we've got all this light spilling everywhere. I mean, there's as much light on our model Iceland's face as there is everywhere. So we've just got light all over the place and that's not really working for me. Because And because why? Well, because it's not giving the image any focus. There's no focus to the light. There's no, there's nothing telling the eye where to go. All right. And I could throw in a vignette after the fact. Sure. I'd rather not do that. I'd rather get what I want in camera and create the look that I want and have more control over the light. Uh, rather than relying on Photoshop skills after the fact. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Now, if I wanted to, I could have employed uh, a beauty dish. The Mola with a grid would have given me a nice circle of light here and kind of caused everything to go into fall off and forgive my messy drawing here, but you get the point. Um, and that, that would give me, given me kind of a beauty look that I really wasn't going for here, but that is one other option that you have. And perhaps I'll create something like that later for you guys, with, you know, focusing on a tight space again. But for this particular image, I wanted something, uh, with a little more contrast that the deep octa was going to give me. And I wanted more direction to the light to create a more dramatic fashion, kind of Gothic inspired image. So let's take a look at uh oops we jumped ahead here let me turn this on okay so let's take a look at our next step and that is to switch to a much softer a much smaller switch to a much smaller softbox and that was started off just to show you what not to do with a, basically a 74 inch octobank it's a wonderful tool but not for this purpose okay so now we're using the much smaller deep octa all right, and I've added a grid to it, all right? But even still, you can see here that while it's changed the quality of light and it's dramatically cut all the light out from down here, there's a much higher degree of fall off that you're seeing all over the image. And we've got this nice kind of circle of light happening around here. We still have a lot of light on the backdrop. Too much for me. Now, I like the light, the quality of light here. It's a little too, I'd probably crank it down a little bit. It's too, uh, too much here, too hot, too specular, um, but it's getting closer to what I want. But we're still, we still have a really flat light. Uh, we still have a light that is giving, providing way too much illumination to the background. We still have no separation between the two, between our model and our background, and no way to really control the, the amount of light falling on uh, either of them separately, right? So we need mechanisms in order to do that. And for that, we move to our next step, which is moving our light to the side. Okay, the direction of your light, the position of your light relative to your model and the background uh, are going to make a huge difference in this case. And you can see here, I'm starting off with one light because it keeps things simple, it eliminates variables, uh, and it also allows me to create a variety of looks later. We'll add in a second look. But I always like to start with one light and just really kind of see where I'm at and what I can do with that one light and what it's creating, what kind of look it's giving me. So here you see the deep octa and its position relative to the backdrop uh, and its angle 
relative to the backdrop as well. And you can see here, of course, the grid. And what that grid is doing is it's helping keep the light from spilling too much onto the background. We're getting some of it, but we're not getting near as much as we would get without that grid, okay? Uh, and you can see the effect that we're getting here. So we've got this lovely light on Iceland's face. We've got these nice catch lights happening in her eyes there. Uh, and we've got a real nice light kind of feathered onto our backdrop, which is giving us a much more pleasing light, in my estimation, than what we were getting when the background was completely lit at the same intensity as our model was, creating a very washed out kind of look. Now we have drama. We have all of this is falling into darkness, and we've got this very much more moody kind of evocative image happening than we had previously. All right, so here's a close-up of that image without all my messy, crazy drawing. I think you'll agree that it is a much stronger image than this. Here's a close-up of what we had when we started off at the very beginning when we had our massive softbox from the front above the camera lighting the model and the background together at the same time. It's, uh, you know, we could always use a much darker background. Uh, that probably would work better, like if we were using black or something like that we would have a, a, a you know a more appealing look but in this case that we didn't have that so i had to make adjustments for that and again i wanted that shadow and that drama that we got by moving our light to the side all right so next i wanted to show you uh what bringing in that second light does for us here we have uh, a strip box a 14 by 35 strip box over here on the opposite side of our key light uh, in a classic cross light pattern, okay, which just means that the lights are facing one another. Uh, and this also has a grid in there. Uh, and you can see here what that does for us. When we add in that second light, it gives us all of this light on the opposite side of our key light. Uh, and it creates a really interesting kind of sculptural, dimensional quality, a more polished look to the image. Um, and I have also, you can see here that we've got this um, nice light on the backdrop and as well on our model's face. We've got our catch lights. Everything's really clicking and working here nicely. Again, much more interesting than where we started off. And now we've taken things up a notch by adding in that kicker light, that second light. Uh, we're also using 500 watt monolight heads okay when you're working in smaller spaces you don't really need as much power so a 500 watt second head you could even get away with less um, the Ellen Chrome Quadro which is 400 watt seconds uh, would work really nicely as well um, so that we're just using 500 watt second heads because that's giving us the power that we need um, all right so let's Move, move along and we'll look at our next thing. So here, uh, basically what I wanted to show you is that it's just simply by moving the key light, okay, by changing the angle of the key light, I'm able to modulate the amount of light falling on the background, okay? So you can see here that now we've got a little bit more intensity on Iceland's face and we've got much less light falling on the background. Just another way to vary the look to create a different kind of effect, all right? So I wanted to show that to you guys. So that is, again, how we are controlling the light. We're just continuing to control the separation between the background and the model and how much light is falling on each of them, all right? So one of the really cool benefits of this cross light pattern that we have here and having this strip box back here and obviously our key light here is that they end up switching roles when your model turns from one side to the other, okay? so. All of a sudden, my accent light, my kicker light, when Iceland turns camera right, now it becomes my key light. And my what was my key light now becomes my kicker light. Okay? So that's a really neat thing about cross lighting. It allows you to really give your model some flexibility, your subject some flexibility to move from left to right without being constrained. Uh, to just only, you know, working with the key light and they have to continuously look toward the key light or if they look away from the key light then everything falls into darkness. Granted, you could use a reflector panel and you're going to have, you know, a more open look, but it definitely gives you some flexibility and it's one of the ways that I really like to work. All right, so again, just to drive home the point, uh, here we started off with, uh, to my mind, a very flat and kind of unappealing looking light. 
Uh, again, it works in a kind of a beauty context, uh, but there's just way too much light on the background, and I wanted something much more dramatic and in keeping with the creative direction for this piece, um, for this shoot, the wardrobe, uh, you know, something that would really accentuate that wardrobe. Um, and by moving to the side and adding in a second light and using grids and using smaller light modifiers uh, with angle and direction, we'd be able to, we've been able to create this really gorgeous effect that you see here. So that's going to wrap it up for this month, guys. I encourage you to continue the dialogue on Facebook and please hit me up uh, in the comments on YouTube uh, when this video is posted and also on the Shutterfest Facebook page. I'd love to hear your questions. I'd be happy to do my best to answer them. And I will catch you next time here on Shutter Magazine.